Jijinder sir, please let me know when to start the session. Wait for two more minutes. Let attendees to join me. Okay, sir. Shweta, you can begin now. Okay, sir. So, good evening and welcome to one and all. I am Shweta from Clarnet, the designated session assistant for a seamless experience of the session. Clarnet is very proud to be a digital partner for this event organized by Indian Society of Pediatric Nephrology. And the topic of today's session is Model 6 Chronic Kidney Disease. Clarnet is India's most trusted and widely used Digitech platform with multiple enriching services exclusively for doctors. Let's begin today's session for which I would like to hand over this session to Dr. Jitendra sir. Over to you sir. Do you want me to or you are speaking now? Yeah. 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 Too much noise here. Okay, so welcome delegates and faculty to this uh, uh, to the sixth module of uh, the webinar series uh, for postgraduates. We begin with the session on chronic kidney disease today. And to chair this session, we have with us uh, two eminent faculty, uh, Professor uh, Dr. Uma Ali from uh, from uh, Mumbai, who was uh, who does pediatric nephrology and intensive care previously at Wadia Children's Hospital. And uh, uh, we also have uh, with us Professor Arpana Iyengar from St. John's Medical College. And uh, both of them have a special interest in chronic kidney disease. So before we begin the session, we would begin with the uh, pretest for this session. And uh, Dr. Jitendra is posting the link to the pretest for the delegates uh, in the chat window. Please answer the questions in the pretest. And we will be beginning with the actual proceedings of the webinar in about eight to 10 minutes from now. Thank you. So I have shared the link in the chat box. Participant, please attempt within the next 10 minutes this pre test.
आदित्य मैम हेलो यस शाल आई स्टार्ट दी वेबिनार यस मैम या सो वी टू बिगिन द प्रोसीडिंग्स मे आई रिक्वेस्ट डॉक्टर उमाली मैम टू बिगिन इंट्रोड्यूस द टॉपिक थैंक यू मैम गुड इवनिंग टू ऑल द पार्टिसिपेंट्स uh i think today we are addressing one of the most serious complications which uh we all hope will never happen to a child with kidney disease but unfortunately there are certain diseases which are not amenable to therapy some which progress despite therapy and some which reach very late beyond the time period where we can reverse or arrest progress so we are faced with problems of chronic kidney disease in many of our children so today we will be discussing about the definition the etiology and how to evaluate a chronic kidney disease as initially as a lecture then as a case discussion thank you ma'am uh, so i'm happy to introduce two uber products of uh, department of pediatric nephrology all india institute of medical sciences new delhi uh, dr mahesh v and dr sudarshan so to address this topic of chronic kidney disease and uh, uh, give you important um, key points on how to uh, how to recognize how to diagnose how to evaluate uh, how to differentiate ckd from aki we have dr mahesh um with his lecture uh, on evaluation of a child with ckd followed by dr sudarshan who will be discussing uh, relevant cases on this dr mahesh yes you ma could proceed please Uh, is my screen visible, ma'am? Yes. 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 Visible. Yes. yes. Uh, good evening, all. Uh, I'm. Thank you for the introduction. So we will be discussing uh, how to evaluate a child with uh, chronic kidney disease today. So we will going through uh, the points which uh, uh, Dr. Uma Ma'am had uh, highlighted uh, uh, just uh, uh, before this. So uh, the definition of CKD is uh, defined as the abnormalities of kidney structure or it could be function which is persistent for uh, more than or equal to 3 months which has a uh, certain kind of uh, implications for the health of a child so uh, for the for the diagnosis in a clinical scenario either one or more markers of kidney damage may it may include either creat serum creatinine or you have uh, something on histology or uh, uh, even a protein persistent proteinuria or certain markers which we uh, usually do in our clinical scenario which would indicate kidney damage or and along with that uh, decrease in uh, uh, gfr to less than 90 ml per minute per 1.73 meter square which are persistent for more than 3 uh, months so there are certain caveats for this definition the caveats are uh, duration of more than 3 months doesn't apply to newborns or infants who have who are presenting with uh, deranged renal functions and uh, which are indicating a ckd uh, uh, who are presenting for less than say 3 uh, months so they would have some uh, anomalies uh, 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 even being a fetus so in that scenario it is tough uh, for us uh, to apply this 3 months criteria the other criteria of that is that is the criteria of gfr Or which is less than 90 ml is not applicable for children uh, less than 2 years because so uh, uh, in children uh, uh, the gfr usually matures the kidney usually matures to a adult gfr function by 2 years of age so application of that gfr criteria might not be feasible in children who are less than 2 uh, years of age so uh, uh, there is uh, there are various uh, 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 varied uh, epidemiologists throughout the uh, world Uh, the number of cases being reported throughout the world of ckd uh, say for less than 18 years of age is variable and uh, you know that uh, many of the children might not present in the early stages of ckd i'll be discussing about the stages of ckd in further slides but roughly whatever the data i could collect uh, so uh, uh, north america uh, particularly has a uh, prevalence of 0.9% and the rest of the countries uh, countries have reported in terms of uh, per million age related populations you know you can see that there is uh, 
quite variable and uh, uh, efforts are being made uh, from our country uh, to uh, collect the data of epidemiology, both in terms of CKD as well as uh, the CKD who are, on, who are receiving renal replacement therapy as well. So overall, it seems to be an underreported uh, problem. Uh, so if you uh, look at the CKD related mortality uh, in the age group between 5 to 14 years, which was uh, recently reported in 2019, you can see that uh, <clears throat> the sub-Saharan -sub -sub African countries have higher mortality. Maybe they have uh, this high-risk variant called as Apol-1, which I'll be telling in the further slides. Uh, uh, the rest of the uh, world has a varied uh, CKD related deaths. Our country has roughly 0. Uh, 0.6 to 0. 0.8 uh, deaths per uh, one lakh population. So coming to the uh, etiology of a chronic kidney disease in children, so certainly the non-glomerular causes, that is uh, the congenital anomalies of uh, kidney and urinary tract are more common in children, which include aplasia, that means that is either absence of, uh, mostly the absence of one kidney, certainly the uh, absence of two kidneys is not viable uh, for the fetus and hypoplasia being both kidneys uh, smaller in size, which could amount for uh, low uh, GFR and dysplasia as well. Uh, reflex nephropathy, which is mostly because of uh, primary vesicoeretric reflex or it could be secondary to a neurogenic bladder as well due to some uh, uh, defects in uh, the spine uh, and spinal cord. And obstructive uropathy, most commonly secondary to posterior urethral wall, which is commonly seen in males. Uh, another non-glomerular cause of uh, CKD is cystic kidney disease, which could include autosomal dominant polykidney cyst uh, cystic disease, autosomal recessive, which is more common, and uh, certain other diseases like uh, uh, nephronophthosis as well. Coming to the glomerular diseases, uh, the focal segmental glomerulosclerosis uh, amounts to maximum number of cases, followed by uh, HOS, IgA nephropathy, which is the most uh, common cause of uh, glom uh, glomerular nephritis throughout the world. Uh, C3 glomerulopathy, lupus nephritis, and anchor associated vasculitis as well. Certain other diseases where you should be careful and they have a uh, 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 CKD progression tendency are the primary hyperoxaluria, which is oxalosis, cystosis, which is a Fanconi syndrome uh, phenotype, and Alport syndrome, which is mostly familiar. So if you look at the uh, etiology of CKDs across the uh, countries, uh, so we have various registries which I have highlighted here. So certainly there also, uh, the uh, etiology mostly is, mostly in children, which amounts to uh, uh, maximum number is mostly the congenital anomalies of uh, kidney and urinary tract, followed by global nephritis and other uh, diseases. So if you look at the etiology of chronic kidney diseases, uh, disease in uh, uh, children across Indian cohorts, I have uh, uh, shared a three snapshot, a sneeze, uh, short snapshots. Here you can see, uh, uh, here also, the mostly uh, it is uh, non-glomerular causes which are more common in children. This is uh, one of the uh, 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 study from a northern part of India, including this. This was from our center in uh, 2003, which was published. And this is from southern part of India, recently published. And here also you can see, the non-glomerular causes, that is mostly the obstructive uropathy or hypoplasia dysplasia, would amount to maximum causes of chronic kidney disease. So how do you differentiate? This dilemma would arise in the clinical practice certainly, and many of the times we are confused whether it is AKI or CKD. So certain uh, clinical features, certain markers, which, you, which would roughly tell you that whether it is AKI or CKD are as follows. Uh, decreased kidney function, say, which is fitting into the exact definition of uh, say uh, the CKD, it, it would be the certain and more uh, reliable evidence of CKD. Ultrasound showing small kidneys, mostly it would be CKD. And renal sonogram showing normal or enlarged kidney, maybe AK or maybe because of polycystic kidney disease, which would also be uh, a, a cause of a chronic kidney disease. If a child presents with like oliguria and daily increase in serum creatinine and uh, uh, blood urea, so it would be mostly AK, but it can also be AK, so superimposed on uh, uh, CKD. So the others like uh, having anemia or no anemia and having some certain uh, 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 bony changes would mostly account for a possible CKD and certain chronic symptoms like fatigue, pruritus, noctu uh, noct nocturia and hypertension would certainly indicate CKD. So uh, this is the Kidigu staging of CKD. You can see it is based upon the uh, estimated GFR. So it has been divided into uh, five stages uh, starting from one to five. 
and uh, five would account for uh, both less than 15 not on dialysis as well as those who are on dialysis. And the children who would receive uh, kidney transplant would also be uh, uh, categorized under uh, CKD5, but they will be labeled as CKD5 transplant, that is CKD5 T. So evaluation, uh, you should, uh, so there are certain uh, 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 rules which you have to follow uh, while evaluating a CKD. So you should go through the etiological uh, uh, evaluation, uh, the etio evaluation of the complications and evaluation of the markers of progression of CKD you have to uh, evaluate. So first, so first we, should, uh, uh, we should we will be going through the history, which I'll be telling in uh, the further slides and clinical examination, what are the markers, what are the clinical signs you have to look into and uh, urine analysis, uh, serum complement levels and uh, certain GN markers like ANA, which would also indicate stomach vasculitis, ANCA, anti-GPM, although rare in uh, children, but it, all, it would also account for a certain number of uh, cases of uh, uh, RPGN, which would progress to a uh, CKD. Hearing and eye evaluation, which I'll be speaking in further slides, and liver function tests, if you have uh, suspecting some diseases, which would cause both kidney as well as liver uh, 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 disease. So for evaluation of complications, you would be looking at the markers of anemia, whether it is iron deficiency anemia or anemia of chronic kidney disease. Uh, uh, serum electrolytes, blood gas for uh, 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 bicarbonate levels, um, vitamin D3, calcium and uh, uh, parathyroid hormone levels and the lipid, uh, lipid profile to assess for uh, dyslipidemia. And pro uh, for the markers of uh, progression, you have to evaluate uh, using serum creatinine, urine protein quantification if uh, feasible, 2D echo and as well. Uh, the various causes of CKD with the help of history. Uh, polyuria, polydipsia would mostly account for uh, non glomerular causes because of uh, loss of concentration ability because of tumular damage in uh, uh, non glomerular diseases, which is mostly the caput. Uh, they would present with growth faltering, mostly short stature and decreased uh, uh, weight gain. Uh, urinary symptoms, if we are suspecting, it should be mostly because of uh, the lower urinary tract. Recurrent UTI would indicate either a, a, a reflux or a neurogenic bladder. Uh, if there is any issues with the stream, it could be mostly a, a posterior urethral wall. Uh, uh, if somebody presents with recurrent UTI and bilateral lower limb palsy, you should certainly suspect uh, uh, issues with the bladder control. Uh, certain uh, cases would present with antenatal detected hydronephrosis, which have to be followed. And uh, they, if there is progressive abdominal distension, jaundice for, with positive family history of, history, uh, of chronic kidney disease, it, would, it might indicate ARPKD or ADPKD, which is uh, polycystic kidney disease, and night blindness, which would also be seen in non glomerular disease, which was uh, uh, mostly associated with uh, uh, nephronophthisis. So glomerular diseases are uh, uh, notorious in uh, uh, early progression if untreated. They could present with tea or uh, cola colored urine. Mostly we could uh, imagine that it is a, a, a color of a decoction of either coffee or a tea. Uh, edema, may, which may be recurrent. Elevated blood pressures and its associated uh, symptoms. Progressive decrease in urine output. And if certain markers would uh, indicate your systemic vasculitis like a rash, joint pain, photosensitivity and alopecia. Sinus symptoms and pulmonary symptoms would indicate anchor vasculitis and uh, abdominal symptoms and uh, purpura over the extremities, which are recurrent, would indicate IgA vasculitis with associated nephritis. Others like uh, his family history would indicate certain familial disorders of CKD like Alport, ARPKD, nephronophthysis, ADPKD. If, if a child has a CKD along with certain dysmorphic feature, could be, which could be seen in Lopez syndrome, barrett Pedal syndrome, renal coloboma syndrome, and something like Tony Brook syndrome. So clinical examination, uh, so most of the times initial presentation of CKD uh, could be non-specific. So it is better to do a, a comprehensive physical examination. Uh, first and foremost thing is to do a, a, a good blood pressure measurement and interpret interpretation of it using the uh, latest uh, AAP charts. And you should also measure uh, growth parameters and assessment of fluid overload, uh, which might be the uh, mostly they would be presenting uh, at the uh, say CKD5 or be ancient renal disease. So at that particular stages where they would mostly uh, uh, require renal replacement therapy, they could present with signs of uh, fluid overload. And you should look for paler and signs of mineral bone disease, including the rachitic signs, which are mentioned over here. And eye evaluation to look for the uh, uh, etiologies like keratoconus, cataracts, coloboma, 
uh, either in the uh, 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 lens or in the uh, uh, fundus and bullseye maculopathy and hypertensive retinopathy because secondary to hypertension caused because of uh, chronic kidney disease so you should also evaluate for uh, uh, hearing where uh, snhl that is a sensorineural hearing loss could be seen in certain number of uh, ckd so uh, coming to the further evaluation you have to evaluate and stage ckd based upon estimated glomerular filtration rate which is measured using serum creatinine so usually the serum creatinine is measured with the help of two methods the old method is chaffee's and the uh, formula which is uh, written uh, which is uh, shown here is called the modified uh, uh, squads formula so it in, it is a uh, uh, k which is a constant which differs if you are using a uh, uh, jaffe's method and if you are using the enzymatic method so the k is constant which is 0.413 till 18 years of age so it is uh, 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 given as a uh, k into height in centimeter divided by serum creatinine we will get the estimated glomerular filtration rate so uh, further evaluation, you should evaluate for urine, urine microscopy for RBCs, which would certainly indicate chronic uh, uh, glomerular nephritis. Urine microscopy for WBCs would indicate recurrent UTI. Uh, urine for protein by dipstick would indicate one of the complication and one of the important risk factor for progression of CKD, that is proteinuria. Uh, if a, a dipstick is not available or uh, uh, if you, are, you have to quantify uh, adequately, you can use a spot protein creatinine ratio or you can do a 24-hour urine, 24 urine protein quantification if feasible. Uh, we know that it is quite tough in children to do a 24-hour uh, quantification, but if feasible, it can be, it can be definitely done. And urine for crystals uh, in certain uh, stone forming diseases, you can uh, do. So other tests which would uh, 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 which are used for uh, uh, finding out the etiology or uh, the complement levels and the markers of systemic vasculitis and uh, the tests for uh, the complications of uh, CKD, uh, which include anemia, mineral bone disease, and dyslipidemia have to be done. So uh, one of the important tests uh, to do in uh, CKD is uh, uh, ultrasonography. Uh, it is it has to be done most in almost all the cases. So what the things which we look at in ultrasonography of uh, kidney urinary bladder uh, urinary tract is uh, the sizes, and you have to compare with the normative data. So we have uh, the Indian normative data, which was done uh, from a, 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 a center from Mumbai, which is uh, with uh, Dr. Uma Mam also. Uh, 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 it was done in Ma uh, Mam's. Uh, uh, center and uh, uh, bladder should uh, we should look at the thickness of the wall and which would which would be seen uh, with, uh, uh, where the thickness of the bladder would be increased in uh, certain diseases like P pov posterior lateral valve and and even a neurogenic bladder ureters for the status whether they are dilated or not it is tough in uh, 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 identifying the dilated ureters in ultrasonography but uh, uh, in a high resolution ultrasonography it is quite possible and to also evaluate uh, for the anomalies of the uh, kidney and the urinary tract and and uh, even in uh, antenatal period, we do a fetal uh, USG to identify uh, the antenatal hydronephrosis. So small kidneys are something below to standard deviation below the age cutoffs and the large kidneys are plus to standard deviation above the age specific kidney sizes. So uh, voiding system uh, urethrogram or mixurating system urethrogram would be needed in uh, certain diseases like uh, vesicoureteric reflux, posterior urethral valve and neurogenic bladder and there is there are these are the typical appearances of uh, uh, posterior urethral valve with a dilated posterior urethra and uh, inverted fertility appearance in neurogenic bladder and the reflex as you can see here so uh, in a certain number of cases uh, you might also require uh, nuclear renal scans uh, to evaluate either uh, gfr or any obstruction of uh, the flow of the urine or to evaluate for the scars so to evaluate for the scars, we would be mostly doing a DMSA scan. Here you can see in this the, in the picture on the right, you can uh, see the photopenic areas. So these are the scars. And in this uh, the uh, image above, this is a DTPA scan where you can see that the right-sided kidney, the uh, 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 tracer is persisting beyond certain amount of time, which would indicate the obstruction on the right side. The caveat in doing nuclear renal scans in CKD is early stages of CKD, it is fine, but as the CKD progresses, uh, there will be more increased background activity and decreased uptake, which would not uh, certainly help in diagnosis. So it has to be choose, uh, it has to be chosen carefully, and you have to do it in uh, only certain number of cases and in early CKD.
So uh, rarely we would also do computer tomography or magnetic uh, resonance image uh, imaging. So uh, so to evaluate for complex congenital anomalies, these are helpful. And uh, kidney stones definitely CT is helpful. And MRI uh, mostly in adolescents or uh, 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 early adults, we would be doing a total kidney volume measurement using ADPKD, where uh, the role of uh, one of the drug that is the tolvaplan comes into picture. Kidney biopsy, uh, I could say it is almost uh, not done now, but uh, if there is uncertainty where uh, in early stages of CKD, the creatinine is not so high, say uh, uh, CKD 3 or 4, uh, we could definitely try doing it, but there is definitely a high risk of bleeding. And if on ultrasound evaluation, there are small, kid small kidneys and complete loss of corticomedullary differentiation, I would suggest definitely avoid. Uh, in that, in the cases where you are trying to do uh, 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 kidney biopsy in evaluation of CKD, uh, definitely uh, it will be helpful to use internasal desmopressin, which would decrease the bleeding risk. And uh, if you are doing, and, and you should be uh, aware of the fact that uh, uh, there, it is, there are high chances that you will be getting non-viable glomeruli, that is figosed glomeruli, which would not help you in uh, fetching the diagnosis. So rather than doing a kidney biopsy, uh, uh, it is better to do non-invasive uh, methods of evaluation, uh, which are GN markers and certain uh, even uh, genetic, which I'll be speaking. So uh, uh, currently, uh, next generation sequencing uh, is one of the important uh, tool we have in diagnosing certain diseases and even evaluation of uh, unknown CKD. If there is strong family history of uh, CKD, like uh, in Alport syndrome, in New York suspecting uh, autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive polykidney cystic disease, nephronoptosis, then definitely do one. And if the child is presenting with dysmorphic features or in certain complement mediated disorders, and uh, in the steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome, and also those who have uh, CNI fa failure, uh, genetic, uh, it is better to do genetics where uh, even after post, if there is a, uh, uh, if there is a variant causing a, a, a nephrotic syndrome is uh, found, it is we would be certain that uh, the recurrence would be uh, minimal or nil in those cases as against uh, non-genetic causes of uh, nephrotic syndrome. Uh, kid, uh, doing genetics or next generation sequencing in cat foot has a low yield overall, although certain number of diseases is uh, we could we can find out through that, but uh, the yield is quite uh, low. So what are the risk factors for CKD progression? Uh, one thing is the uh, type of the disease uh, which is causing CKD. That is glomerular uh, diseases have uh, very high risk of progression and early progression uh, as compared to non-glomerular uh, diseases. Uh, GFR, that is the glomerular filtration rate at the diagnosis would certainly help you or tell you uh, like uh, how fast would the CKD progress. If the creatinine presentation is say uh, three, to something like that, and uh, the clinical scenario is fitting into uh, chronic kidney disease, it could be, uh, it could be uh, uh, definite. It could be definite that the progression would be early. Proteinuria and uncontrolled blood pressures are definitely most important uh, uh, risk factors for progression of CKD. And untreated mineral bone disease, uh, having high uh, PTH levels, would uh, uh, further worsen the CKD. And even metabolic acidosis is also one of the important risk factor for uh, CKD progression. And uh, uh, you should be treating all this uh, and uh, you should be using certain uh, therapeutic strategies, which we would be discussing in the further slide. So uh, this is a, a, a heat map or chart given by uh, Kidigo uh, uh, guideline 20, uh, 2012. Here you can see that uh, the CKD would be divided in based upon three categories. One is definitely the GFR, the other is the albuminuria category. So you should be aware of, of the fact that you should be well aware of the fact that uh, albumin, this, this is mostly an adult guideline. And uh, 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 there are certain number of studies where uh, it has indicated that, where it has shown that uh, album, uh, in children, it is uh, uh, albumin, whether, whether we have to do albuminuria or proteinuria, it is uncertain, but most of them would indicate to do proteinuria because as we know that uh, children with CKD have most commonly are related to acute and there the proteinuria might not be uh, only albumin, it could be some tubular proteinuria as well. So it would be better to do uh, a proteinuria rather than albuminuria. And you can see that uh, uh, higher uh, uh, stage of CKD associated with uh, increased proteinuria will have early progression uh, as against uh, lower uh, uh, stages of CKD with uh, mild or normal albuminuria will have uh, lower risk of uh, progression. So uh, 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 what are the uh, 
data what is the data of uh, risk of risk factors for progression of ckd in uh, children these are the single center uh, cohorts one from uh, brazil which was published in 2010 here you can see that uh, overall uh, cacfood that is congenital anomalies of kidney and urinary tract as ckd etiology has less risk as compared to uh, 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 the glomerular causes and uh, proteinuria and uh, the gfr at presentation are definitely the early markers and one of the important markers are the hypertension as well uh, this is a cohort from uh, india southern part of india uh, recently published in ki uh, uh, here you can see that glomerular disease and egfr at baseline are one of uh, few important risk factors and also proteinuria and uh, uncontrolled hypertension as well so uh, this is one of the uh, 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 a uh, graph which was recently published in uh, a american journal of kidney diseases where it would indicate it would indicate where you can estimate roughly the time from at, at the presentation and uh, we can estimate at the time by which uh, the child would progress to esrd so here you can observe uh, by the outlook that the glomerul the curves in the glomerular causes of uh, ckd versus non glomerular causes the glomerular causes have a steep uh, 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 curves because Uh, we were uh, we are well aware that the glomerular diseases diseases would progress early because they have a certain amount of proteinuria and which would be more compared to non glomerular causes so uh, this these are various categories uh, labeled in uh, different colors which include uh, the stages of ckd as well as the amount of proteinuria higher the proteinuria higher the stage of uh, uh, ckd or the faster is the progression if uh, it is a non glomerular cause and no proteinuria then you can see that the progression is quite late as against a uh, higher stage of uh, uh, or higher creatinine at presentation with heavy proteinuria the progression is quite fast so uh, the last one uh, of this presentation what are the potential therapeutic strategies for prevention of uh, kidney disease progression as we discussed previously the main culprit would be uh, the hypertension and culprits are hypertension and proteinuria along with that there is also a uh, uh, renin angiotensin aldosterone system where we would be using ace inhibitors uh, that is mostly uh, enaraprel we are you know enaraprel or ramipril which we are commonly using in uh, ckd so this has anti proteinuric as well as anti hypertensive anti fibrotic and anti inflammatory uh, effects which would help in both uh, reduction of hypertension as well as proteinuria so 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 hypertension uh, as we can see that any all the all the hypertensive drugs have certain amount of effect on proteinuria as you decrease the uh, blood pressure levels certainly your proteinuria levels would also decrease so the most commonly and the uh, 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 best drug overall would be a uh, uh, ace inhibitor or uh, arb so the targets for uh, bp control in uh, chronic kidney disease is those who are non proteinuric the uh, target would be less than 70 pips and time those who are proteinuric better to control uh, much more strictly that is uh, less than 50th centile proteinuria these that is calcium channel blockers and beta blockers would also help in reduction of proteinuria our target would be to decrease it to less than 300 mg per meter square per day even metabolic acidosis plays an important role in uh, progression of uh, chronic kidney disease so keeping the uh, bicarb bicarbonate levels uh, during the follow up for say more than 20 to 22 would be certainly helpful in uh, decreasing the progression of chronic kidney disease so uh, the take home messages are uh, the ckd is one of the important cause of morbidity and mortality in india in children uh, deciphering the cause of ckd is quite important so that we could have a, a, a definite plan so history clinical examination and basic lab evaluation would mostly suffice to diagnose most cases of ckd kidney biopsy in ckd is mostly not done now but can be done carefully in certain number of cases so next generation sequence in unknown ckd is helpful and it is uh, uh, the latest latest add on tool for uh, diagnosis of uh, kidney diseases proteinuria and hypertension are the main modifiable risk factors of uh, ckd progression which uh, which when uh, well controlled would help in uh, decreasing the progression of kidney disease overall thank you thank you mahesh for uh, encapsulating the whole evaluation of ckd so concisely and clearly i think we'll go over to the case discussion presented by dr sudarshan and take the question answers at the end of both and uh, participants are requested to put your questions in the qa 
box. Uh, good evening, everyone. Ma'am, am I audible and is no slides visible? Yeah, yes. you're audible and slides are well seen. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am, for the kind introduction. Good evening, all. Now, uh, Dr. Mahesh has given you a clear overview of what is CKD, how do you, uh, what are the etiologies for CKD in childhood, which is very different from what commonly seen in adults, and how do you go ahead and evaluate children with CKD overall? Now we'll try to see the common case scenarios we see in day-to-day -day practice and try and see how evaluation in each of these children would be helpful. So uh, first is a seven-year-old boy who presents to you with recurrent urinary tract infection since early infancy. He was treated outside with oral antibiotics each time without much evaluation. The mother realizes that child is not growing very well and subsequently is brought to you for further evaluation in view of poor growth. At this point, mother does not give you much history. And then you see the child and you realize that child is pale, is malnourished with a weight of 12 kgs at 7 years, which is at minus 4z score. And he's stunted with a height at minus 3z scores. He is hypertensive with blood pressures more than 90 at the same time. Systemic examination otherwise is unremarkable. The kidneys and bladder are not palpable. The spine is normal and rest of the systemic examination is unremarkable. So this is a typical case scenario which we all of us encounter in most of the OPD practice. So with this history, uh, the possibilities which we would consider are posterior urethral valves and obstructive uropathy like picture posterior urethral valves, reflux nephropathy and neurogenic bladder. Now in this case, an important history which we should remember is to ask the mother, especially if it is a boy, that is there any poor stream and dribbling which the mother has noted. Many times, because most of the time these kids are in diapers, mothers fail to notice or uh, unless you ask them specifically and probe into the history, you may miss this history of poor stream. So it's important that we elicit a history of poor urinary stream and intermittent dribbling, especially when a boy who comes with recurrent urinary tract infection. Because many times from this history, you are almost clear of your diagnosis and you can work your evaluation accordingly. We go ahead and do basic evaluation for this child. Uh, you find that the child is anemic, microcytic hypochromic picture, low ferritin, now suggesting iron deficiency anemia. Child has a creatinine of 2.6, corresponding to a glomerular filtration rate of 16, inching towards stage 5 CKD. He has mineral bone disease with low calcium, high phosphate, elevated alkaline phosphatase. He is vitamin D deficient and he has a very high uh, parathyroid hormone levels. And you can see in the x-rays here that the child also has nice rickets. The albumin is relatively preserved at this point and there is metabolic acidosis. The basic urine evaluation shows that uh, there is dipstick shows 2 plus protein. There are no red blood cells and there are 4 to 5 white cells per hyperfeed. And there is some subnephrotic range proteinuria. So with this history and evaluation, the first next test which you would do is to go ahead and do an ultrasound. A good ultrasound helps you clarify so many things. Uh, a right kidney here shows, right and left kidneys are relatively normal size with bilateral hydroerythronephrosis. And this is an important component which you should try and elicit in these children, especially when there's a suspicion of lower inner tract obstruction. Bladder wall, whether it is thickened or not, and what is the post void residue. So generally, to for easy really for you to remember, any uh, bladder wall is considered thickened if it is more than 4 millimeters, although we have different cutoffs at full bladder, partial bladder, but and it's okay to remember that a bladder wall with more than 4 millimeters is generally considered thick. A post void residue, this means you uh, full bladder you have evaluated, you make the child to go and pee and come back and then you take took an ultrasound again and look for the bladder volume. Uh, generally, you don't expect it to cross about 20 millimeters. So here, uh, with PVR of 65 ml means there is significant post void residue. So this is again worrisome. This is showing that probably you're looking at some obstruction. So when you get such picture, the next uh, important test you would do here is a micturating cyst urethrogram. So this is the MCU which you got in this child. Here you can see very clearly that uh, there is a dilated posterior urethra. The bladder neck is also hypertrophied. You can see that there are diverticulum in the bladder and you can see a nice reflux. 
so this is a typical picture of uh, posterior urethral valve dilated bladder with uh, obstructive features so most of the time you make a diagnosis of pv right here so if the mcu is not very clear then there are times when we'll have to evaluate further to get a clear impression if you are looking at a neurogenic bladder you will get the typical christmas tree like pattern here and if you're only looking at reflux nephropathy you'll see that the urethra is clean the bladder is normal you just have bilateral significant reflux so generally reflux nephropathy with this kind of ckd probably there is some also some amount of hypodysplastic kidney you may see that the kidney sizes may be small in these children so further evaluation in this child you this is is a urodynamic study uh, it's okay if you don't understand much i'm just trying to introduce you what this study is uh, so these are the various pressures which you try to look at at abdomen at vesicle and detrusor pressures you can see that the uh, p det detrusor pressures are very high here this is prior to surgery suggesting that detrusor pressures are very high and this is one urodynamic study which is done in follow up post surgery once you have ablated the wall you see that the pressures have nicely normalized so this is what is a urodynamic study which we often do in such scenarios to try and identify what is the detrusor pressure uh, elevated pressure is bad and it will affect the upper tract so now that this is a case of posterior urethral valve uh, you will apart from optimizing the child the important evaluation you will do here is to go ahead and do an endoscopic valve ablation so you book a slot with the pediatric surgeons and go ahead and ablate the child you, uh, correct the other metabolic parameters child had anemia metabolic acidosis had nice mineral bone disease and hypertension we correct all of them very well remember most of these children are also constipated so it's important that you identify bowel bladder disturbance thoroughly and evaluate them thoroughly and treat them also an important part in managing these children is a good sound follow up now remember once ablation is done the surgeon's job is more or less over it's important that we follow these kids regularly because already in this child we have realized the child has already in ckd stage 4 to 5 in other kids who are just at early stages even if they have ablated on time many of them will go on to develop uh, ckd and other problems in future so it's important that you follow now special problems in such children are uh, to understand and identify the bladder the bladder may be tough or fine and it will be difficult for them when these patients when you prepare them for kidney replacement therapy in the future it's important that the bladder is corrected so you'll have to look at what is the bladder whether any augmentation is required how is the pressures whether there is high pressure and you need to add, add some medications or something to reduce the pressure and is the child continuing to have recurrent urinary infection it's important that these are addressed prior to taking up these patients for transplant otherwise we are going to have a tough time post uh, transplant that they keep on developing graft pyelonephritis so this is how you evaluate and manage this uh, kind of a scenario we'll move on to the second case this is a 5 year old girl who is a frequently relapsing nephrotic syndrome since 2 years of age she has uh, been on mycophenolate for the past 3 years and she has done reasonably well with about one relapse a year now two months back she relapses and this time on she does not respond to steroids so she has received 6 weeks of steroids however she has not gone into remission so she is brought to you for further management Now you see that the weight and height are preserved. Blood pressure is just at ninety fourth centile on that day when it was evaluated. Child is not very pushing right, so probably because she did well on microfilm. There is some mild fetal edema. Rest of the systemic examination is unremarkable. So you do the baseline labs. The creatinine is point four, corresponding to GFR of one zero six. The albumin here is low at one point eight, so which is expected. This child is uh, not responded to six weeks of steroids. You see that there is heavy protein urea. There are no red blood cells, and the protein creatinine ratio four point five. So this is a typical steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome. Now we call this late resistance because this is a child who was initially responding to steroids, did very well for about three years on mycophenolate, and now in a subsequent relapse has turned resistant. So this is steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome, which is late resistance. Now categorizing them as initial resistance and late resistance is important because they have implications in recurrence post transplant. A child who is initial resistance or the first instance is never responded to steroids and who has a genetic mutation identified is less likely to recur post transplant. Whereas this is the typical uh, picture of kids who will have a uh, they are attributed to likely to be having a circulating factor which is unknown and. these patients are likely to recur post transplant so much so that some would even recur on the operation table just immediately after the graft is uh, connected 
So the next stage here would be once you have made a diagnosis of thyroid resistance is to go ahead and do a kidney biopsy. This is just a representative image to show what changes would happen. So this is the kidney biopsy, light microscopy. You can see this is uh, enlarged glomeruli here. These are the tubules. So you can, this is the hilar end. Uh, you can see that these areas are, uh, for you to understand, they're more pinkish here than this. So these are the glomerular capillaries which are open and quite okay. However, here there is uh, focal segmented glomerular sclerosis. So the glomerular sclerosis is happening here. Now, this is called FSGS because not all glomeruli involved. There is only some foci of glomeruli which are affected. And within an affected glomeruli also, as you can see here, some part of glomeruli are normal and it's only some part which is affected. That's why it is called segmental. So, it is focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. So, there is a so we are looking at steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome with FSGS on the biopsy. So, typical management would involve starting these patients on calcineurin inhibitors. So, in this trial, we had started on pactrolimus at a started low dose of 0.1 milligram per kg. Also, supplement with low dose of ACE inhibitors and titrate both upwards. Parents had been counseled for unit protein monitoring, compliance to medications to take pactrolimus regularly twice a day. In follow-up, you realize that the TAC levels initially was 3.7, then you titrate the dose, and in follow-up sometime later, you find that TAC levels are okay. You would generally want to keep the tack loads between 4 to 8 nanograms, and at 6, we are quite okay with that. So you continue the patient on the same. However, despite few months on uh, CNI, you realize that by 7 months, child is still having nephrotic range proteinuria with heavy, uh, heavy proteinuria, and serum albumin is still much below 2. So uh, about 7 months is a reasonable time on CNI with a good level where you would probably think that probably you're looking at the CNI resistant nephrotic syndrome. Now, I just put this case so that you will understand the series of events that might happen in a child which you would encounter as a nephrotic syndrome. Uh, initially, to begin with, as frequently relapsing, subsequently termed steroid resistant, and this child uh, unfortunately did not respond to CNI also and became CNI resistant. Now, important part in these children is these are the ones who are likely to progress faster and develop CKD. So, uh, some uh, patient, people would want to give a trial of rituximab at this stage because the child has not responded to uh, calcineurin inhibitors. However, this also failed and child still continues to have heavy proteinuria. At some point here, you would also do a genetic testing and next generation sequencing was ordered and you did not identify any variants. About 80 uh, genes, monogenic causes of FSGS are known currently and we did not get any variants in any of these genes. Now then subsequently, when you follow up this child, you see that this is at the onset of steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome. Child was having low albumin of 1.8 when he presented to you. You have been putting uh, the child tried CNI reasonably and did not respond. Then slowly you realize that child is now progressing. So you can see that creats are climbing up and the GFR is significantly falling. Albumin has not really picked up. Heavy nephrotic range protein is persistent. So the plan here would be uh, once you realize that child is progressing, then uh, CNI will be withdrawn. Uh, put them on antiproteinuric agents, chiefly analateral. But remember that these children progress rapidly, so you need to monitor them carefully because analateral may act as a double-edged sword. The moment you realize that child is progressing faster and hyperkalemia starts setting in, then you might have to get them off analateral. Optimize their diet. Important to immunize them and prepare them for kidney replacement therapy. Important problems in this patient would be a recurrence of FSGS like what I have discussed earlier. So it is important to prime the parents that this is a, a problem which you might encounter. So you, this discussion has to be clearly uh, confronted with the parents when choosing the donor and planning accordingly. Uh, more detailed discussions will be there in the subsequent classes where complications and KRT are specifically addressed. This is just to give you an overall outline of how evaluation is being done. Okay, moving on to the third case. This is a 13-year-old boy who comes to you with periorbital puffiness on and off for the past one year. There's been three episodes of gross hematuria following an episode of URI each time, and the last episode was two days back. Mother feels recently that child is uh, of late having decreased hearing. However, mother denies that there is no family history of CKD or sensory neural hearing loss. Examination, child has grown well, blood pressure is normal, and systemic examination otherwise is unremarkable. The basic labs show that creatinine is mildly elevated. Now, important that always do an estimated GFR for the creatinine. Then only you will realize uh, that patient 
a 0.7 for a 13 year old may look normal to many but if you do a EGFR you realize that child is already in stage 2 CK. C3 here was normal. Urine shows uh, dysmorphic RBCs with 2 plus protein, some subnephrotic range proteinuria. Kidney sizes are normal. The, the normal ecogenicity and corticomedullary differentiation is well maintained. Now you realize that child has a microscopic hematuria currently. There has been episodes of gross hematuria following URA in the past and child also has on and off edema. So uh, now here it is important that uh, you should ask a proper family history do a good pedigree. Although the mother did tell us that there was no family history of CKD, it's important that you do baseline evaluation to unravel so many things which I discovered. Uh, once you know that there's dysmorphic RBCs, you know that probably looking at some glomerular nephritis, you do uh, basic eye and hearing testing. Eye evaluation this child was normal. This is a representative image where you can identify this is lenticum, as you can see, right? The lens and it is conical. So this is a very pathognomonic feature of Alport syndrome. And when you look at fundus, you realize that they're macular flex. I'm not sure how visible this is, but you get a lot of dark here around the macular flex. You may also get retinal pigmentary changes and some blurring of this macula, which they call resin. So these are all some features which suggest that child is having Alport. So these are the extra renal manifestations of Alport. A simple visit to an ophthalmologist with the specific uh, suspicion will yield a diagnosis in such cases. It's important that you uh, appropriately refer such patients. You do a hearing assessment by Puritan Auditor and you see that child already has bilateral, moderate, and cerebral hearing loss. So here we have a child with uh, microscopic hematuria persisting for quite some time with some moderate sensory neural hearing loss. So here the chances of a uh, disorder like Alport syndrome is high on cards. Now, before we proceed further into much more eva detailed evaluation, it is important that despite the mother said there is no family history, it is not unreasonable to get a simple urine routine examination of the mother. You will get surprisingly such things that when we did for this patient's mother, although mother had, was totally asymptomatic, mother is having microscopic hematuria. Uh, not much of proteinuria and creatinine is normal. She has always been well, so she never got herself evaluated. So many times we pick up Alport only from this. Now, presence of this microscoping hematuria on mother on multiple occasions will probably tell you that if it is an Alport, you are looking at an X-linked Alport. So normally when you evaluate these children further, an important evaluation that uh, which comes along is the kidney biopsy. So this is a representative kidney biopsy, not of this child, which you can see the densely packed tubules, this glomeruli essentially is unremarkable. Uh, there are no specific features of Alport on the light microscopy. You may get some mesangial proliferative GN-like pictures. Occasionally, you may get some FSGS. Uh, interestingly, many times we see a lot of foam cells thrown around in the light microscopy, which the pathologist would tell us that probably are we looking at Alport. Otherwise, there are no any specific features suggestive of Alport on light microscopy. Immunofluorescent my examination is generally unremarkable. The key in kidney biopsy here is to do an electron microscopy. This is an electro representative electron microscopy image. If you see here, this is the glomerular basement membrane. So it is thin here, nicely going around. This, the ones which are abutting are the protocytes. Here, if you see, this is uh, a variable length. This is increased. Okay, so here it is a thin GBM. Here, this GBM is widened. So this is what we call as basket weaving appearance, alternating thin and thick GBM, which is a typical feature of Alport syndrome. Now, uh, an important thing to realize is the, these findings are variable, may not be present in all patients with Alport and may evolve with age. So a three-year-old, when you do a biopsy, electron microscopy may not really, uh, these findings may not have come up by then. But by the time uh, you repeat a biopsy later during the course, you may realize that these findings are there. So electron microscopy, absence of this does not rule out the disease, but generally presents, confirms it. Now, with advent of time and with easy availability of genetic sequencing, we no longer routinely do a kidney biopsy. Kidney biopsy is now taken a step back. Genetic sequencing is much easier. You just send a blood test and you can make a diagnosis. In this child, it turned out to be a call 4A5 duplication, which is hemizygous. So, suggesting call 4A5 variant, that is X-linked Alport syndrome. So, this was a likely pathogenic variant. So, this clinches a diagnosis of uh, Alport syndrome in this child. And uh, it's important, genetic sequencing is very important in these days in such patients because one, you can uh, I confirm the diagnosis and avoid invasive testing like a kidney biopsy if there is high suspicion of Alport already on clinical and basic evaluation. 
second you uh, prior to genetic uh, prior to transplantation it's important because you this will help you choose the donors so if it is called for a5 uh, generally you would avoid most of the time many times you see that mothers are the donors here mothers are definitely cannot be the donor and you should be very careful in choosing your donors because although the mother may be asymptomatic when you test them you realize that they are also alpha x linked alpha they were previously called carriers which are no longer considered so it's important that you do genetic testing and you may pick up a lot of uh, the other sibling may also be having this disease and totally asymptomatic identifying them early and initiating them on a simple therapy like uh, enalapril makes huge difference in their renal outcomes the management in this child chiefly revolves over keeping a uh, maximum tolerated dose of 8 mg so here about 10 mg per day of enalapril and giving a good supportive care uh, uh, as i said for the kidney biopsy hearing also progresses with time child may have mild sensory neural hearing loss to begin with but as the child progresses may start developing severe sensory neural hearing loss so repeated testing for hearing is also important and appropriate initiation of hearing aid when required it's important to screen siblings and reemphasize and mother to be here referred to an ophthalmologist to initiate the uh, hearing monitors for herself and follow up when you consult the patient for regular follow up again here it is important to discuss about donors selection now mother unfortunately in this time would not be cannot be a donor We'll have to discuss about other options for kidney replacement therapy as we plan this child further. It's also possible that putting this child on a lateral and child mo monitoring them uh, regularly, this may retard progression of CKD considerably and you have good time before the child progresses further. Uh, last case for the day, we have a 10-year-old girl who is referred to you for maintenance hemodialysis. Uh, there is a history of edema with oliguria and gross hematuria four months back. There is no history of preceding sore throat, rash, alopecia, or a ulcer, arthritis. Child was admitted elsewhere. She was dialyzed, few sessions of dialysis, and then a kidney biopsy was done. And then subsequently, child is referred to us. This is the kidney biopsy image. You can see nice uh, crescents here. So this we are looking at a crescentic glomerulonephritis. And then you see that there is child is having full house G A M C one pure all positive. This is a typical full house nephropathy. So you have a crescentic G N with full house. So your likelihood of systemic lupus erythematosus with lupus nephritis is high you subsequently target your evaluation you realize that child is already having anemia with this bct positive so much uh, hemo hemolytic anemia with thrombocytopenia creatinine at this point is 6.4 c3 c4 has been low albumin is low ana is 3 plus with speckle pattern and dsdna titers are positive you, uh, protein is 3 plus there are some rbcs child is having nephrotic range protein area the ultrasound is uh, norm uh, normal with increased uh, somal size kidneys with increased equos and maintained CMD. So now you make a diagnosis of lupus nephritis. You know that there is present a GN full house nephropathy, ANA is lupus, so we are reasonably sure of the diagnosis. Time was subsequent and IGV uh, hemodialysis capital was placed in the IGV and hemodialysis was done. Following with this kidney biopsy had shown a present GN with full house, probably class 4 lupus nephritis. Child was started on immunosuppression. Typically, you would give them help in this long pulses. And here, child was started on cyclophosphamide, monthly pulse. Child had received three such sessions of IV cyclophosphamide monthly for the next three months. However, child continued to remain dialysis dependent, hence was subsequently referred to us. Child is on oral prednisolone. Supportive care is continued. Child is requiring three per week maintenance hemodialysis. So, you, uh, when the child is brought to you, you realize that child continues to be aneuric with a urine output of less than 100 ml per day. At this point, you discuss with the family and then you decide whether you would want to give further doses of immunosuppression or you may uh, uh, give up at this point and tell you almost three to four months of immunos intense immunosuppression has gone in, child has not made any difference and unlikely that further courses may make any difference. When you taper prednisolone to the lowest possible dose. Now you target good supportive care, you initiate, uh, you maintain her of three per week maintenance hemodialysis, complaints to medications you explain, and then uh, advise uh, to make a fistula at the earliest and plan further evaluation. So these are the four cases. So these are the typical cases which we come across in our routine patients. So you realize that each of these patients are evaluated in a different way and managed also differently. So the important messages here are the etiologies for CKD in children are variable and CACUT is the most common etiology we identify in most of our patients. A systematic approach is almost always helpful. It avoids unnecessary evaluation. Simple tests like doing a good urine makes us 
gives us a clue to the diagnosis many times. Important to have individualized care, optimized CKD, and plan for kidney replacement therapy timely so that we can over overall improve their outcomes. And these are a few of the references. Thank you. Thank you, Sudarshan, for taking us through these different cases, which beautifully illustrated the variety that we see. The individualized evaluation based on clinical uh, clues. And once you come to CKD, the management kind of slowly starts getting more typical and uniform because you've reached a stage where now no further therapy for the primary disease is feasible and we are coping with the end stage. I think uh, there are a few questions in the QA. So can we take the questions? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, so I think uh, I can see, I think, two questions. Uh, one is for constipation and CKD, peg or lactulose is better. So Mahesh, would you like to take that question? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, uh, we certainly we use mostly uh, lactulose, but I do I don't think so. There is any contraindication for using uh polyethylene glycol and uh, studies comparing uh head to head between these two I in children and I'm not sure. So uh, it's either... because of the high phosphate content that they're asking the question, Mahesh. Okay. Okay. So, uh, uh, yeah. In uh, so if uh, phosphate enema definitely would be avoided. Should be avoided in CKD for the issue of increased uh, phosphates. Uh, so most we would be uh, most of the times we would be using uh, lactose uh, in CKD. Uh, the next question is: Is there a role of medical nephrectomy in real world in children with frequently relapsing nephrotic syndrome, stroke, SRNS with heavy proteinuria? and frequent nephrotic syndrome-related complications. So from the sound of this, this doesn't sound like a CKD from the way the question is framed. So Darshan, would you like to address yes, this? Yes, ma'am. So in frequently relapsing, nobody would consider thinking of any such therapies. You have a lot of therapies. You'll be aggressive on immunosuppression. It's important to realize that all patients do not respond to one particular therapy. That's why you have a myriad of options available. I think we should try and uh, exhaust all our options before really going up to with these things. Most of these children with frequently relapsing do respond to therapy. Now, the ones with steroid resistant who are CNI resistant are the ones where we may get such complications. Uh, practically, uh, it is on a case-to-case -case basis. There's no uh, real uh, strong, robust evidence to say that doing this definitely prevents Obviously, at, at times, some would, uh, in refractory conditions, some would definitely consider doing that and see if it helps. But uh, routinely recommending for all, uh, I don't think so. Yeah. I think in the absence of an end-stage kidney disease uh, scenario, one wouldn't go for medical nephrectomy or surgical, except perhaps in congenital nephrotic syndrome, sometimes with massive proteinuria and difficulty in maintaining nutritional state, etc. I think remaining, uh, th there are questions which have already been answered on the QA. Yes, so, ma'am. Aditi? Yes, ma'am. So if you permit, shall we go over to the post-test then? Uh, yeah, thank sure. Thank you very much for Aditi, moderating. Uh, yeah, can, I, can, can I just yeah. ask yes, a question please. to both Mahesh yes, and please. Yes, uh, please. Sudarshan? Uh, both of you have now... Uh, settled in uh, premier institutes, AIMS, uh, Mangalgiri and JIPMA as a faculty. Uh, so for the postgraduates who are here, uh, what is the message you'd like to give in terms of early detection? Because we still in tertiary centers see at least one third of uh, CKDs coming in late stages. Uh, so uh, what would you both have to say in that regard as to early detection? Um, from a postgraduate point of view or from a pediatrician's point of view? Um, okay, ma'am. So, uh, they, uh, as a postgraduate resident, when you handle kids, there are some very simple things which, if you can do, can make a lot of difference to many of these children. Uh, 
I'm aware that most of the time you end up seeing a lot of nephrotic syndromes in your population. So um, uh, it's important to convince the parents that a regular follower do a proper protein dipstick at home and approach a physician at earliest when there is in collapse. So the, most of the problems happen when they come much late, have recurrent relapses, develop AKI, and then, you know, then, then they go on to develop TKD much earlier. So the typical nephrotic patients, a proper diary, regular follow-up will help you prevent most of these things. Many other patients, uh, majority, many cacoots may give you a good clue at antenatal stage itself. So if there is antenatal hydronephrosis, you, it is important that you evaluate them postnatally. Simple tests like doing one creatinine, uh, one ultrasound will help you pick up a lot of disorders. Timely intervention is really helpful. You can really prevent a lot of CKD much uh, earlier in many of these patients. That's another important thing. Third thing is, uh, it's important that you measure blood pressure in many of these kids. Uh, a simple blood pressure will help you identify a lot of things. Uh, and here, probably CKD could be a cause for hypertension in that particular patient. A proper cuff and a proper hypertension uh, blood pressure would help you pick these kids also up. So simple, simple things which you come in day-to-day -day practice. So any child with poor growth also keep CKD also as a differential in the back of your mind. A proper evaluation, just clinical examination for hypertension, having some pallor that already gives you a clue that this could be CKD. So these simple interventions, if you do timely and refer appropriately whenever there is in doubt, probably we can prevent a lot of them coming at much later stages and prevent a lot of complications. Uh, I think we missed one question because it was in the chat box, uh, that if a lupus is getting transplanted, what are the prerequisites? Can one of you take up the question? Okay. So, um, so uh, one thing which we would like to see is how active the disease is currently. So the previous line of thought was we would always used to wait them out for about a year after the so that the disease becomes recent and then try to take them up for transplant. But the current Gedigo guidelines is any time about six to six months is also enough. So some but sometime post six months to twelve months is the time when you would start thinking. This is in that subgroup of population who have not responded to any form of therapy you have given and continue to remain on maintenance hemodialysis like we are seeing with almost any area. So in such patients, uh, you evaluate for, uh, look for this question period also, apart from the routine evaluation that you would do. Yeah, I think we've done with the questions, Aditi. Uh, once again, I thank our moderators, Professor Dr. Uma Ali, ma'am, and Dr. Arpana, both for moderating the session and handling the Q and A so nicely. Uh, ma'am, we'll go, with your permission, we'll go on to the post test now. Uh, we would like yeah. to hand this over to Shweta now. Thank you. Hello. Hello, am I audible? Yes, Shweta, please go on. Uh, Ma'am, uh, may I know, do we have any uh, polls today for today? Yes, the same pretest that was there. Uh, has Dr. Jitendra not shared this? Uh, well, Ma'am, it was not known to me, Ma'am, regarding this. I did uh, send questions to Aprajita. Jitendra, can we administer the same pretest link? Can you open it again right now to allow uh, students to answer? And can can we just uh, uh, can uh, Shweta just read it out from the pretest link without putting a timer on? I can share that link. Okay, ma'am. Open it up for responses again. Sure. 
or shall we just call it a day now and people can put their responses in the post test and we can close the session now and we can close the post test after 20 minutes will that be okay yes ma'am okay so we meet again on friday next for the next uh, second session of this webinar uh, a series of, of this module on chronic kidney disease so uh, with that we'll just post the chat window in the chat window the post test link which is the same google form but we have we are going to use it as a post test this time uh, i think we should keep the session open for the next 10 minutes to allow participants to be able to paste the link from their chat window thank you Jitendra, have you opened it up to allow people to respond? Yes, ma'am. I've uh, now allowed the response. The link is working now.
Jitendra, shall we close the session then? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So thank you, delegates, and thank you, faculty, for the the talks today. And uh, we'll meet again on Friday with the second talk of this module. Uh, thank you, Shweta. We can close the webinar. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, everyone. So we are thank ending you. the session over here. Thank you.